Well, good day to you all as we get into our confirmation lesson on Bible structure as well as an introduction to creation. And so this is a recap for those of you that are uh, in the eighth grade, uh, seventh grade, you spent more time in regards to the Bible structure. But um, I wanted to make sure that we were doing a recap and just a quick review of the Bible uh, and its structure so that you're a little comfortable, a little more comfortable in using it. So um, again, hopefully you've got your Faith Alive, Faith Alive uh, Bible with you. It may be looking like this. It might have a different, uh, you may have a different binder. It could look like something like this as well. But this is the one that I'm using uh, through the class. And, and uh, when I refer to page numbers, it's going to be the ones found in this. Also, I hope that you got your binder, the eighth grade binder, and uh, we're in lesson one. And so hopefully you have that open to those to that first page so you can take some notes and uh, answer some of the questions that's already um, asked of you and you can just fill it in. So um, anyway, without further ado, then let's get started with uh, uh, with the next uh, just kind of looking at that Bible structure. So uh, what I want you to uh, just kind of be reminded of is that there are two main parts of the Bible. And you probably already know this, but I want to make sure you do. Uh, that's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Those are the two main parts. Uh, it's not equally divided. You probably remember uh, the Old Testament has uh, 39 books, while the New Testament has 27 and so that's a total of 66 books or 66 books and letters uh, contained in our one Bible. All right. uh, now there are six categories and um, I mentioned if you look at page six of your Faith Alive Bible you will see the six categories listed. Uh, they're color coordinated, uh, color coded and uh, if you, as, so if you're looking at your Bible you're going to see this kind of page here and you're going to see right on here the the six categories and, um, and what's kind of cool is when you turn your Bible on the side, you'll see those colors listed and uh, showing on the margin there. And, and, and so you will know which category, if you learn them based on the color coding, you'll know that these books of Moses are right there in that first uh, portion of the Old Testament. So the six categories, you know, as I just said, the first category in the Old Testament is the books of Moses and there's the first five and then you've got the history books and uh, then the wisdom and poetry books and then you have the books of the prophets and you have major prophets you have minor prophets and that is basically dealing with the amount of writing that they submit uh, the content of their book so the major prophets uh, those have a lot of content the, the books are gonna be a lot longer like Isaiah and Jeremiah those are going to be a lot longer than some of the lesser prophets, the, the ones that have lesser information, like the book of Jonah. It's only four chapters long, so um, they're, all, um, they're all important. It's just based on the, the content uh, is why some might be referred to as major prophets or minor prophets. All right, so those are the four categories in the Old Testament. And then you've got the New Testament, which has two categories, and basically, and you have the Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those give eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. And then you have the epistles, and those are um, also called letters, uh, primarily written by Paul, but there are other letters as well, the general letters written by uh, people like uh, Peter or James, and, and uh, even John has written a few letters. So, But those are the six categories uh, that we basically categorize the different letters and books of the Bible. All right, the five books of Moses. I've already um, kind of alluded to them. They're the first five books of the Bible. So uh, first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All right, uh, those we attribute to Moses having having written them. And, uh, and, and, and the Jewish uh, people, the Jewish scriptures, have always attributed those to Moses. All right now, the four Gospels, as mentioning already, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I'd like to ask if you're just kind of pondering this. Um, the four Gospels are eyewitness accounts of, of Jesus' life and ministry, but only two of these guys are actual disciples of Jesus in the sense that they walked with him and talked with him and ate with him and traveled with him. 
uh, those two are Matthew and John. <clears throat> and so Matthew and John are the two that um, were actually disciples of Jesus, uh, you know, first generation, you might say, disciples. Mark and Luke came, um, I mean, they came within the, the uh, lifetime of some of the other disciples, but it was after Jesus' death uh, that we have kind of, you know, them coming along and getting involved. So Mark got involved a lot with Peter and his ministry, whereas Luke got involved with Paul and his ministry. And so, uh, so they were very active in the early church. But nevertheless, those four uh, give us the Gospels, which are, again, eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now, one thing I want you to do for homework, and that is number five on your, uh, on your homework, on, on your uh, paper. And uh, page one, toward the bottom, we got page five, or question number five. And I want you to read over page 1311 in that Faith Alive Student Bible. So uh, if you turn to page 1311, it's in the New Testament, you're gonna find uh, a little uh, one page description about the epistles and these letters. And so what I want you to do is read over that and uh, and just know, you know, what are epistles and what do you find interesting about them? And uh, you'll be able to discuss those in your small group on Sunday. So uh, just kind of read through that and find a couple things that you think are kind of interesting and then you get to share them in your group, all right? Okay, so uh, now we've got this diagram of the books of the Bible, and what I'm showing you uh, is basically, imagine uh, a bookshelf at your home, and a bookshelf that has three shelves, and on those three shelves you got books, okay? Now, this bookshelf uh, has a lot of books, but there is one little difference than the one that you might have at home. And that is, know that the top shelf and the middle shelf of this diagram contain the same books. What you'll see is if you really compare them, you'll see the exact, excuse me, you'll see the exact same books on the top shelf and the, and the middle. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna get into the description of what they are. So this top shelf is the Hebrew scriptures Okay, and so the, this, is, this top shelf is what the Jewish people have as their scriptures. You'll notice that the um, uh, first uh, five books of the Bible are, are exactly the same. The uh, books of Moses, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then, and then things start to change up. I mean, we have the same, and Joshua comes after that, and Judges. And, 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 but then as you work on down the line of the Jewish scriptures, you're going to see a little difference in ordering based on their categories that we have as Christians and how we look at our Old Testament. Now, I'm not asking you to try to memorize the structure of the Jewish uh, scriptures, okay? But I do want you to know that, they're, that they have the that our Old Testament is what they use as their scriptures, but we also, we have the same content, we just have them in different categories and in different order. Um, so just want you to be aware of that. Now the middle slide, uh, the middle shelf on this diagram that you have on your in your binder, page two, um, this middle shelf is our Christian structure of those same books that the Jewish people have, but it's our Christian structure and and it's so it has some different categories uh, it's the same content we just put them in a different order now, again some of the books are in the same order but some of them are going to be different than what the jewish people have but again the same content all right so also i want to point out when you're looking at these images of these books you'll notice that some of the books are a lot larger in the diagram than the other books so just by looking at the very middle of this and that poetry category. As you look at there, you're going to see the book of Psalms. It's like the biggest book that's listed there. And, um, and so it's the biggest in the diagram in this illustration because it has a lot of content in your actual Bible. So if you compare it to the book before Psalms, which is Job, or the book after Psalms, which is Proverbs, you'll see that those other two books have a lot less content in your Bible. But the book of Psalms has a tremendous amount. So I want to call that to your attention, that the larger the uh, book of the Bible is in this diagram, that correlates to the amount of information 
in your Bible. All right. And so you see these categories uh, in this diagram. It listed history, poetry, and again, major prophets and minor prophets. Um, a little different categorization than what um, the Bible has, your Faith Alive Bible, and the different categories that it has. Um, this illustration has a little different category, but the same order of books. Um, and I point this out because I want you to know there's no one right way of categorizing all the different books of the Bible. Um, but nevertheless, this is a generally accepted way. We can, you can just summarize all of the prophet books as prophetic books, um, or you can kind of break them down into a little subset, major prophets and minor prophets. So, anyway, uh, let's move on to the New Testament books. All right, here you've got the, um, you know, in this category, the way these are categorized is you have history, and you have the Gospels and Acts. That's your first uh, four books, the history um, and the eyewitness accounts, those Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have that book of Acts. kind of stands kind of on its own um, because it's just that beginning of the life of the church. But it does connect to Luke's Gospel because Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. And and so book the book of Acts is seen as like Luke's uh, second volume, all right? So his first volume, his first book is the gospel, Luke's gospel. And then his second volume, his second book is the book of Acts. Now, the book of Luke describes the life of Christ. The book of Acts describes the life of the church, how God was working through his disciples, all right? And then you've got these letters. And so, again, in this category, the categorization um, of your Faith Alive Student Bible, it basically just gives you two categories of the New Testament, you know, the Gospels and the Epistles. Right? But in this diagram, you see that it's broken down a little bit more, a couple more categories. So it gives you a little more detail. Um, it breaks down the letters into Paul's letters, and then there's general letters. And then, of course, the last book of the Bible, um, the Apocalypse, which is a letter that John ended up writing because he got that vision from the Lord. And it was a letter that was to be circulated to the seven churches to which he wrote. So it was a letter that was sent out and to be circulated among these designated churches. Um, it's also a letter for us today. So it's kind of a both and. All right, so with that being said, you see um, the New Testament books and um, and the categorization that they had. And then kind of looking, backing out of the uh, uh, bookshelf, if you will. Again, the top shelf in this diagram that you have in your, in your binder. The top shelf is the Jewish structure of the books of, uh, of what we call the Old Testament. Um, it's their only, their only scriptures because, again, they don't have the New Testament because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, And so because they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they don't um, acknowledge the New Testament writings. But because we do acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah and fulfills all the Old Testament writing, uh, we have not only the same content, um, the Old Testament, which is... Um, our, our Christian structure, that middle shelf of the diagram. But then we also have the New Testament writings, which um, give us the life of Christ and the life of that first century church. Okay, So that's a great breakdown of the books of the Bible. And something, uh, hopefully that illustration, that diagram that you have, is something you can refer back to and just get, a, get an idea of, of the books of the Bible, the order, and also their size, the amount of content they have. All right. Okay, so wrapping that up, now again, that's just kind of a quick review of the Bible structure. Uh, I do want you to memorize the books of the Old Testament. I mean, ideally, and by the end of your confirmation time, I want you to know all 66 books. But by the end of the month, when we have our test, I want you to um, have at least, you know, gotten hold of the Old Testament books. Okay, and so I, I can promise you on the test there'll be a question like, um, what are the first, um, or I'll just say, what are the books of Moses? And and then you'll be able to write uh, those Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, but so I'll ask questions like that. I might also ask questions like, uh, what book comes after Joshua? 
And then you'd have to know which book comes after Joshua. Uh, what book comes after Isaiah? You know, so I may ask questions like that. And, uh, and that, you know, that way it'll tell me if you really know the books of the Bible. I'm not going to ask you to write out all 39 books of the Old Testament. Okay, but I do want you to have a good handle of them. So, all right. Well, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me about that. Now what I want to do is switch gears a little bit and start our uh, time of creation. T uh, this little introduce this. Um, not going to be a lot uh, about creation. We'll get into that uh, not only a little bit today, but then we'll get into it more next week. But um, here we got the just kind of an image of the Sistine Chapel where Michelangelo painted this years ago. And uh, it's a beautiful, uh, I've never been there, but I've seen pictures, seen videos. Uh, but if you can imagine a gorgeous church ceiling that gets painted. And what he did was he painted all kinds of scenes of scripture. So all kinds of scenes. He painted different prophets. He painted different uh, situations of scripture, you know, um, events. And this, this event is, is the creation, the creation of Adam. Now, if you look at it, you got Adam on the left, and he's kind of like, you know, the grown man kind of laying there, got his hand out. And then you've got God the Father, the one with the beard and the flowing robes, carried and surrounded by all these angels, okay? And he's reaching out his finger, and, and this idea of their fingers touching, um, that's kind of like Michelangelo saying, the, the beginning of life, okay? I ask you, is this how Scripture describes the creation of Adam? And the answer is no. You know, if you're reading the scripture, and, I, and I'll have you do that in your uh, next week's or homework, and this week's homework, and then into next week. But when you're reading chapter 2 of Genesis, you know that's not how God brought Adam to life. You know, God formed him out of the dirt. You know, he's a dirt man. That's what Adam means, actually. And, and, but, but God the Father breathed into him you know, the spirit, the breath uh, of life. And so Adam comes alive because God breathes into him. So that's how God uh, really created and, and then brought to life uh, Adam. So, but nevertheless, this is Michelangelo's uh, painting of it. And it is a very, very popular, very recognizable painting um, that is mentioning uh, creation. And, and so I'm using that just for this uh, description for this unit, not because I, again, not because I think it's a great interpretation of scripture, just because it's identifiable as creation. All right, so what does the Bible say about creation and how God uh, created the world? Well, you've got a few Bible verses uh, listed here. I've got four of them on your handouts and your binder, and I've got those four here, but there are plenty of other uh, Bible verses, uh, lots of Bible verses that deal with God creating things. Okay, and I'm just giving you these four. Uh, so, Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? That's, what, that's how it starts. Um, doesn't describe where God came from because God didn't come from anywhere. Right? God was already there. So, in the very beginning, God was already in existence. And this is what he did. He began by creating the heavens and the earth. All right, so then in Hebrews chapter 3, this is a writing in the New Testament, it says that by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Okay, now that, might, that verse might be some kind of a little confusing, so let's break it down into the two portions, the two phrases there. Um, the first phrase, by faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command. Okay, in other words, it's not by science, and it's not by our ability to rationalize things. It's not by proof in the world that we're going to know absolutely that God created everything at his command. Instead, the scripture tells us, it's by faith. By faith we understand that God formed everything. Now, I do believe this to be true. I also believe that in God's creation, in creation, through science, you will see God's handiwork. Okay, you will see the amazing things that God has done as you study science. So you may not prove it, you know, the science may not prove it, but science, which is God's creation, study of God's creation, will testify to God 
as the one who made it. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, and so then the second part of this phrase, second part of this Bible passage, is uh, describing how God really began creation. It says that what is seen, so in other words, our world, the material world that we look around and live in, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. In other words, God didn't just start creation by looking around the world and seeing all the stuff and pulling it together and making the world. He didn't start creation by using stuff already in existence. The Bible tells us there wasn't anything else in existence except God. Okay, so, so God did not use stuff already around to create, to begin creating. Instead, God made the stuff. He spoke it into being. Okay, and so Exodus 20, 11, uh, another Bible passage says, In six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. All right, so here we have kind of the structure of the week where God does his creative work in six days, and then on the seventh he rested. And you find this described in Genesis chapter 1. That's what Genesis chapter 1 is all about. Okay, now did God, uh, did God rest on the seventh day because he was exhausted? You know, because he was so tired of creating everything? Well, no, he didn't. He, he rested on the seventh day to model for us how our life and work would be. But also, he rested on the seventh day because he knew creation then, everything that he had created in the first six days, would then honor him. He's that kind of God. He creates everything. And then even all of creation, not just mankind, but all of creation will praise him. And, okay. Uh, so then John 1, 1 through 3. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Okay, so here's a beautiful text where John the disciple starts off his gospel with a creation account. Okay, his gospel, this is, of course, in the life of Jesus. He's describing Jesus' life. He begins that uh, gospel with this creation account. You know, if you are a person watching the Chosen uh, TV series, uh, not really TV, I guess it's on the app, you know, you download the app and you can watch it. Um, you'll see in episode one of the second season about John trying to come up with this idea of how to start his gospel and what to include. And it's an interesting take on how on how that developed. But this is what he's talking about in that episode. So, but anyway, in scripture, it says at the beginning, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Right? Now, if you got your uh, Faith Alive Bibles, and uh, or whatever Bible you may have, but hopefully it's the Faith Alive Bible, uh, but just look also at verse 14, that same chapter, okay? The ver verse 14 of John 1 says that the word became flesh and lived among us okay so what we have is this powerful connection of what john is describing in the first few verses about the word being with god in the beginning and being god and then in verse 14 how this word becomes flesh and lives among us so what we see john doing is he's recognizing that Jesus was not just man, he's also God, that he is the Word incarnate. He's the Word that becomes flesh. So Jesus, you could say, was there in the beginning in creation, and that nothing that was made uh, was made without him. Everything that was made was made through him. So that's pretty cool. All right, so those are some things about creation. So here's a question. Uh, what did God use to begin creating the world? So you can look at Genesis 1, 1 through 5, and you will see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Verse 1. And, but then what it describes is how God spoke light into existence. Okay, so if you're reading those verses, you will see that God speaks light into, 
into existence. And then he separates the light from the darkness. And he calls the light day. And he calls the darkness night. And it's the end of the first day. And it is good. Right? So God, what does he use to begin creating the world? Well, he uses his word. That's how God uh, begins his creation. And that's what... Um, you know, the the writer of Hebrews was getting at was that God didn't start creating with, with a bunch of stuff already in existence and then he pulls it together. Now, there was nothing except for him. Okay? Now, to continue on that, God didn't just speak everything into existence because when you look at Genesis 1, 24 and 25... I asked this question, how did God continue making the world? Well, and, and, and so it talks about how, how God is, um, you know, says, let the earth bring forth animals. And it talks about the different kind of things that are going to crawl on the ground, creepy things and things of the air and things of the land and the sea and just this kind of like all this stuff is going to come out. And, and, and it doesn't describe God as speaking saying let there be a giraffe and boom there's a giraffe and let there be mosquitoes and boom there's mosquitoes and let there be you know whatever is your favorite animal you know that's not what god is doing but the scripture here in verses 24 and 25 say let the earth bring forth and these these animals and such now, I bring that up because I think, you know, it wasn't until I was later in life, actually, and probably in my 20s, that, that something clicked there in that, yes, God spoke everything into existence. He got things started with let there be light, and, and he's speaking all this stuff. But then even in his speech, he starts using what he's created. So now he's using the earth. And so when people talk like in evolution, and we're going to get more into this in the in next week, but when people t start talking about evolution and they say that because they find uh, substances that are similar in the ground and in certain species and, and mankind even, that, that we must have evolved from the earth and we evolved out of this stuff. When creation is saying, no, you know, God purposely brings us about, but we are connected you know, because we're all part of God's creation and we're connected to the earth. We're connected to his word. And so, um, so basically looking at this verse and answering this question, Genesis 1, uh, 24 and 25, how did God continue making the world? Well, he used his word and creation. Okay, he used his word and creation. So it's not only is he speaking, but he also uh, finishes it up with uh you know, with the things that he did build. So I don't think this goes into to conflict with the writer of Hebrews and talking about how everything was made out of things that weren't, you know, visible. Uh, I don't think it's a, in conflict with that. Um, but I do think that God, yes, he's speaking it, but he's also using his creation there in that text. We see that. So he lets, uh, he lets the earth bring forth these animals. So pretty cool stuff. Anyway, this I'm going to wrap up now, uh, this unit, uh, just a short, brief 30-minute uh, unit. I'm going to try to do that for our videos and for our topics each of the uh, weeks of this 8th grade confirmation. And so hopefully you'll have a video every week. Um, I'm going to try to keep it to be about 30 minutes. And, uh, and that way you'll get an idea in case you missed class or if you did attend class but you want to review some of the information, uh, I want to make sure that you have that uh, available for you. Well, God bless you, and uh, until later, uh, until next week, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.